in this section, we're progressing on with conducting cognitive testing with young children in early intervention, where there may be real challenges because of a child's attention, motivation, the distraction, or the fact that they can have meltdowns or behavior difficulties. And then here we're going to explore some more direct adaptations that you can make. That first section we looked more at the way we may structure up the session. This is looking at more things we might do with the child that go even further into the levels of scaffolding and adaptation or alterations to standardized administration. So in no particular order, we're just going to look at a variety of ways that we may adapt a session. And one of the things that we might do is that before we actually start the testing, before we engage in the scoring component of the assessment session, understanding that a whole session is being utilized to gain this cognitive score, but all those other tasks are also teaching us or are giving us information about what's happening for the child. So we may deliberately do some activities at the beginning or with the first testing items. Do a very scaffolded teaching exercise. So for example, we might model and instruct a range of behaviors that are really important for engaging in work. Again, this is very much based in the ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, but also has some elements of teach to it. So one of the things we might do is teach and reward what we call safety behaviors. So for a child who can be very impulsive and grab things or can become quite restless and move around, what we might do is practice and teaching even with hand over hand, with good, good praise and rewarding, doing actions like hands on table, tell me if you don't know, it's okay not to know. Or we might use the four on the floor idea. So feet on the floor, bottom on the chair, hands on the table. In other words, what we're doing is we're modeling and showing what we're expecting a child to do, praising and rewarding them for, for doing it, to set the momentum, the standards that we're expecting during this session. So with a child who I normally struggle or I'm starting to suspect is going to start struggling, might deliberately sit next to the child at the table rather than across from them and deliberately do an activity that's not part of the scoring and model or hand over hand, demonstrate hands on the table. That's great hands on the table. Terrific. Now here's the puzzle, and this puzzle is meant to be a fun one, and then be praising them so they're getting a sense of what I'm asking of them. And when they go to grab something, that's great. When they go to grab something that they shouldn't be grabbing or isn't part of it, reminding them that the items that we're doing, so we're doing the puzzle and grab their hands, place it back on the table, hands on table. And when I'm doing this sort of work, it's certainly something I'm going to explain to a parent beforehand that we might be doing. Or if I've had to adapt to it because I'm using a more structured up approach, we started with very little scaffolding and I'm adapting and bringing this in, I might just turn to the, the parent and explain very quickly what I'm doing. Another thing that you might try and teach a child very early on is that we can take a break. So. And I might model this. So we do an activity. So now we're going to take a break. First, we'll take a break and then we will. And then even maybe teach, teach a child to say, if you're getting tired, tell me you need a break. Say break. If I see a child becoming a little bit tired or a little bit distracted, say, we need a break. Say break. Break. Great. Let's have a break. In other words, you're engaging from the beginning of teaching modeling and rewarding the behaviors that help a child re-engage when they become unraveled or distracted or starting to lose the thread of doing the work. For children who are particularly very active and are even going to struggle to get to the table, let alone stay there, might really use a hand over hand teaching system for success with the first tasks. So really show them how the visual system works, help them do the task completed and let them know they're getting a reward for doing it. So you may have a very high schedule of rewarding at the beginning. So for example, we do one task and then you get the reward and then we do the fun activity for a little while and then 
We do two activities, then you get the reward. And then we do three activities and you get the reward. Now, again, this is all very standard applied behavior analysis, but these can be integrated very naturally, very naturalistically as well. And with good rapport for a child, these are not things being imposed on top of them. It's giving them clarity and making the session work for the child better. Because if a child feels clearer of what's going to happen, feels they're going to get fun things, and knows that they're not going to have too many demands or pressures or expectations placed on them, then they're also going to have a better time. And isn't that what this is meant to be about? One of the most important aspects of your observation or your thinking, one of the reasons that it's important to remain calm and mindful during these sessions, even if you're being physically quite busy, is you need to pay attention for those little warning signs of unraveling attention. We often go wrong, not just in doing testing, but behavior generally, is that we tend to wait till children have actually escalated to explosion, to meltdown or tantrum before we react, despite the fact that there are in fact quite predictable warning signs earlier on that difficulties were going to arise. So when we start to see a child losing attention a little bit, we might try and redirect them back to the work, and that's fine. But what we also might do is spend a little bit more, or invest a little bit more consideration that if we start to see a couple of these behaviors, that rather than waiting for the child to completely lose intent, uh, attention, become totally disengaged, totally give up on the task because they're feeling like they can't do it, is that we might in fact direct and divert away from what we're doing earlier. So the child is finishing on a greater sense of success. We might go into a fun activity, take a break, or do an easier activity. Either way, what we're doing is not waiting till things have gone wrong and then having to react. Now, I hear some of you saying, yeah, but what happens when we don't even get that far? And this is true. So let us go back for a minute and what do we do with children who come into the room crying, which will happen, or children who won't leave their parents, or in fact, as has happened to me, hide under the chair of their parents, or won't leave their parents' knees. Well, first thing is this is part of the physical setup of a room. If you have a very busy crowded room where it's very easy for children to hide away from you then you're increasing the chances that you're trying to cajole a child out rather than letting the room speak to them that it's at the table we're meant to be and this is where the fun stuff is so i have as little in that room as possible and if it's a room that i'm using where i can't remove everything i screen it off don't have any difficulties with putting up things to actually put everything behind it, stack it so that it's all out of reach and out of, of access. And in some of the sessions that we did where we had tables and a whole variety of things, we actually put the tables on their side to make a wall and put everything behind it so that the only, asp only area within that room that was accessible was the bits that we wanted. Secondly, this comes back to the fact that the way you set up your session is as important as anything. This is why going out to the car or meeting children in the waiting area is important. There are times where a child is too anxious or too shy and needs to be in their parents' arms. But unless it's absolutely necessary, don't want a parent carrying their child in or holding their child's hand. This is what you're doing from the waiting area. The function of the visual schedule the reason that you're crouching down, being eye to eye, and showing them what they're going to do that's going to be fun, and guiding them with your hands, one hand behind their back, just gently letting them know, and the other hand pointing to that we're going into the room with the visual schedule in your hand, and having the parent right next to you, is that you're creating a sense of being okay and coming into the room. And as soon as they come into the room, letting them see where the fun is, or with a visual card is that they have to go to. So you're generating that momentum from the beginning. I think this is important. We expect people, children, young children, to adjust 
and adjust to parents talking and us having all that transitionary greeting stuff. And for many children with autism or learning disabilities, this does not work. However, for some children, this doesn't matter. You can try these ideas and they won't be effective because the child is too anxious, too upset. And in that case, the parent is going to be bringing their child in either by carrying them or holding their hand. We'll always attempt to discourage a parent sitting down with a child on their knee if we can, but you're never going to do that in any cruel or uncaring way. In other words, if you have a very distressed child, you're not going to add to that distress. So you, you, what you'll do first and foremost is wait it out. Wait it out. And if that takes 10, 15, or even 20 minutes, that is fine. For some other children, it might be that you can get the parent to provide maximum level of support by actually having the child sit on the parent's knee or the child sitting right next to them. And then you're going to look about fading, fading that out. In this situation, the child sat right on the mother's knee. And then as the child became more relaxed and comfortable and felt that they could actually do the tasks, just gave quiet cues to mum, very subtle, quick, whispered sentences to move gradually away every minute or so. So just shuffle a little bit, shuffle a little bit, shuffle a bit every couple of minutes away to the point that the child was actually quite okay with doing the work without the parent being right next to them. But let's come back to this child that won't leave the parent's knee. So one of the things you might just simply say to a parent is, this is okay, let's take our time. Do not place pressure that's not in try and encourage or cajole her to come off your knee in any way. Give her time. I'm then going to say something like, however, don't cuddle her or make it more inviting to be in your arms. So she can sit there, but you're not doing much. And if, if it is then comfortable and okay to be in a position of where the parent might in fact move to being next to the chair rather than on the chair, or placing the child next to them rather than just on their knee. But again, if the child starts screaming or becomes upset, then we're not going to do that. Here's the key. Allow the child to de-escalate and adapt to the room, to their comfort. The biggest mistake we make is trying too quickly to conjole or excite or enthuse this child by our toys. And what we don't realize that we're doing is that to a child who is distressed, so therefore highly dysregulated, that anything that we do simply adds to that escalation. So even though we bring out a toy that seems to be fun, we're giving them something to process process the materials, process our instruction, we're placing a demand on the child. And if they're already highly dysregulated, their default is simply to escalate higher or withdraw back into their parent. So wait, wait until the child is, is calm and relaxed. Wait till you see behaviors that illustrate that the child is now watching you and comfortable watching you. Wait until the child is showing behaviors that indicate they're prepared to make an approach, that is move. If this takes 15 minutes or 20 minutes or even 30 on some occasions, this is absolutely okay. What we do do is we put a time limit on it to a parent. We'll say, look, there's no rush here. There's no pressure. If a child's name is not, not going to be okay in doing that, that's fine. We're going to stop after 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So put a time limit. Let, let a parent know that there is a, there's a time you're going to do this. But until that time, you're absolutely okay. Now, one response can be that you might start talking to a parent and asking them questions. You can do this. I would do it calmly and quietly and not get into full chat because this gives the child a sense of there is still something happening here. In other words, if you're talking to an adult, they have reasons to bury their head or remain safe or use their parents as a base of safety. So what we might instead do is ask some gentle questions or deliberately talk in a quiet tone of voice. I'm not going to move any closer to the child or the parent. 
keep at a distance, but allow the child to feel that they're orienting, adapting and becoming comfortable with the room. When I start to see some of those approach behaviors, still not going to rush by offering the child a toy or saying something to the child that can quickly see them hide back under their shell. Some little techniques you can do at this moment is that you might leave a highly desired item near the child and you're narrating what you're doing. I'm just going to place the bubbles near near your mum's feet and then I'm going to go away. And you leave them there and you make no efforts to talk about it, to encourage the child, but you're now giving them something they can watch with safety. If the child goes to approach it, I'm not going to suddenly run over there. I'm going to let them come off their mother's lap, look at the item, pick it up, but they'll need help. They'll need help with the bubbles because they can't open it. And then what I might do is say, I'll open it for you. And I'll gently walk over and on my knees, open it up, and then hand them the bubble top, not the bottle. I've got that in my hand and give them the bottle, the bubble top. Now some children won't be able to blow in it, that's fine. And then when they see that they're not going to be asked to do anything because I've moved back a little bit, I got the bottle, they've got the top with the, the bubble blower, then if the child is looking for more bubbles or for someone to blow it, I'll blow it for you. And I gently hold out my hand, very slowly, leaving it there. And if I see that the child is not withdrawing and they're okay with my hand being in their proximity, I gently grab the bubble blower, put it in the bottle, blow it, and then hand it back to the child. In other words, I am showing this child I am safe, this can be fun and no expectation of something unpleasant is going to be placed on them. And only when I see that this child is relaxed and enjoying it, I then say, let's do more bubbles. And then I bring the bubbles over to the bubble, over to the table and start blowing some straight away. When they come over and they're standing near the table, I give them the bubbles or the balloon or whatever toy it is. And then I might say, hey, let's sit in the chair. And again, many of these ideas are taken from things like applied behavior analysis and positive behavior support, but they work. Again, the absolute core of these approaches is remain relaxed. Don't feel the pressure to do it quickly. I've explained to a parent what I'm doing. I'm saying I'm in no rush and I'm still gathering lots of information about this child. So again, in these assessments where we might be doing them with the parent as support, there are variations. So for example, there's no reason why you can't actually with some of the tasks have the child sitting on the parent's knee and then you bring the booklet over to them and say, there's one here missing, which one of these goes in here? And then using a fun activity around placing it on the table and allowing them to come down and get it and then getting the parent to sit there. There is a whole host of very, very variations that we could be using to allow a child to be more comfortable and then fading it out bit by bit by bit. Once a child is comfort comfortable, once they feel relaxed, then we're able to look at reintegrating it into the way of a more standardized assessment. With this girl in particular, what was very important is that we chose a very small room where there wasn't a lot of options. There wasn't a lot of places to run and hide. And as you can see, we had some toys up there slightly out of reach, in other words, inside, but would require us to get them down as a bit of an enticement, but it wasn't necessary at the table. So even though we didn't want the child running around, quite happy with her being able to feel comfortable to leave her mother and I'm just as happy for her to be comfortable to leave the mother and walk somewhere else in the room than to feel the need to come to us because once she's feeling comfortable to leave her mother, then we're one step closer to coming back to the table. Again, patience and very importantly, understanding that as a process, we can enjoy this even when a child isn't engaging and appears upset. So therefore, one of the ways to really adapt assessments is to understand that it is a session and that we might actually start the session with something fun rather than starting off with the work. 
And for some children who are highly anxious, we might actually get mum or dad to be doing this fun activity because introducing us as a stranger straight away is just too much for this child. And then what we might do is once we found out that this activity is working in this session, we know that this child likes bubbles. We've already established that with mum and dad. And mum is doing it in the session here. And then what we might do is get mum to hand to the to us the bubble so that we're now doing it and creating a triangle. So we're inducing a sense of calm and fun. Now, in, in applied behavior analysis terminology, we're conditioning ourselves as we're using reinforcement to condition ourselves or non contingent reinforcement. That's fine. Whatever way you want to look at it, what we're doing is we're letting this child knowing we're safe, we're fun. And this may take 5, 10, 15, 20, even 30 minutes before this child's going to sit at a table and do work for me. And that is okay. So when you're doing the work, the child is now sitting at the table. But whilst doing it, the child becomes too disengaged, too unraveled or too upset. What do we do? Well, if the problem is that the child is simply losing engagement or interest or motivation in the task that you have where you need a score, either turn this task into a game. Remember, another option is that you can simply end this task and bring out a game and play it. In other words, get in quick, see the warning signs, and before this has a chance to become even worse, simply divert into something that's more fun and try and bring it back later on. That can work very well. What I'm emphasizing here is that you can actually also turn the task into a game, the actual assessment materials. So for block design, you can start doing a whole host of things. We can turn it into an interactive game. Because at this moment, if you don't do something, you're going to get no score from this child. So you're better off having fun with it and trying to re-engage the child than simply to persist with something that's only going to see them not want to do the task and be harder because they've become very upset to re-engage later on. So for example, with block design, I might actually say, well, will I do it? They're not going to get the score for this item. They failed it. They are losing their attention. They're losing their engagement and they're becoming distressed. So what I want to do is attempt to re-engage them through fun and taking the pressure off them. If this doesn't work, then quickly moving into another activity. One that is going to be more fun to regain some momentum that it's okay to stay at the table. If the child then becomes distressed and there is little that can be done this is okay this is okay all it means is if all else fails we're simply going to turn this session into an interview with the mum a discussion a gathering information by talking with her and we'll reschedule for another time or we will re readjust our, our system and have a more scaffolded one that's got a greater chance of working now, a parent may say that they don't want to redo it. They think it will be too difficult for the child. And that is also fine, because at least you have some information. The reason that we want to remember is that if all else fails, and even the language is not, not what I really mean here, that even if you're not able to complete the testing, you can still use the session very usefully to gather information from a parent or engage in some other activity that the child will enjoy. But before we get there, there are other things that we can try. What are some of the things that we can do to minimize the likelihood that a child will escalate up to a meltdown or becoming upset? Well, first, when we start to see the warning signs of a child becoming distracted or impulsively grabbing something or turning away, stop the task and wait. Just see if the child's attention will naturally drift back and that all they required was a momentary break or they were just momentarily distracted. If not, give it a few seconds, but in your mind, count this out to either being five seconds or 10 seconds and call their name and wait. And if that doesn't work, and they don't return to engaging in the task. With the same tone of voice, call their name again, but don't Add any new words, don't provide any explanation. 
what you're attempting to do is simply recapture their attention. If the child starts talking about something that's unrelated to what we've been doing, follow their lead, comment on what they're saying, comment on what you're noticing their attention rests on. If the child has started to look outside the window or look at something else in the room, name that which you have seen them look at. Follow their lead. By following their lead and simply naming it, this may be sufficient for them to have the break from the work and then they may naturally come back to it. And if not, simply re-request the task, re-request the question and see if that works. If not, count down the difficult activity and remind them of what they're going to get, their preferred activity. In other words, let them know how much there is left of the, the work to do. Three more questions and then we'll play with the balloons or three more questions and we'll build Lego. Similarly, break this down even further that each time that they then complete the next question or the ne next task, tell them how much room remaining. So two more questions and then we'll build some Lego. Another way of looking is to simply stop the task. Say something like, well, we'll do just one more and then we'll finish and do this maybe later. Or just, let's do one more and finish. What you will try and do if you can, and if you feel that you've got a chance of it working, is to negotiate one more so that just being distracted, just grabbing an item or looking away isn't what's going to just necessarily in of itself end the activity. But if not, just end it anyway. Another way of putting it is, we will finish just one more. What you're attempting to do is introduce the idea of negotiation, contracting. Another thought to have around this is that you positively lead the child rather than comment or name behaviors they shouldn't be doing. So rather than saying stop, stop moving in your chair or stop being restless or stop missing, we talk about what the child should do. So hands on table. So rather than saying don't touch, pick up the blocks rather than them, no, don't leave. Remind them, sit on the chair, feet on the floor, bottom on the chair, hands on the table. Make sure that you provide specific instructions the child can follow, that is behaviors they can see. Provide one instruction at a time. Allow the child to request that instruction before the next one. So rather than now sit back down and complete your work, and then when you've completed your work, we're going to then do, put it down to one instruction, sit in your chair, when they're then cooperating with that instruction, it's now pick up the pencil or pick up the blocks or look at the book. If the child does leave, if the child has got up or is in the process of leaving and you don't feel that you've got enough time to provide the positive instruction of sit back down or it's too late, they've gone. One way of looking at it is rather than seeing this as a problem, is not only to go with their lead and name it, but in fact, turn it into an instruction. So if they're getting up and you can see they're looking at their parent, say, okay, go to your mom and get a drink or go to your mom and have a break. In other words, you're directing them in a positive way as if this is part of it. You're still setting the scene for what is going to be done here. Once the child has left the table, once they've gone to their mother or they're walking around, wait. Don't rush. This is where taking a breath and understanding that everything that is now occurring is part of the assessment session. It is part of our information gathering. The fact that the child gets up and leaves the ta table is part of your inform information gathering. What you now have is a further opportunity to gather more information about what works for this child. You're now moving into not just describing their standard scores in a test, but looking at the difficulties they have engaging in tasks and ideas that can be effective in helping them engage more. So wait a few minutes, be patient. If they start to pick something up, 
that's their then name that they're doing it. If they go over to their parents and name them, oh, you're going over to your mum. Then what we're going to try and do is that when we feel the time is right, is re-engage them back to the task using behavioural momentum. And the idea of behavioural momentum is that if we can get a child to co cooperate with an instruction they're likely to do, it makes it more likely that they're going to then cooperate with the next instruction. And if we can get them to cooperate with that instruction, which they're likely to do, it makes it more likely they'll then cooperate with the next instruction. So what we actually do is we request them to do an activity we know they want. Like, oh, come over here for the bubbles, or I want you to play with the bubbles, or I want you to play with the balloon, or the Lego. And once they've got that in their hands, oh, I want you to build, I want you to pick up the bubble blower whilst you're still holding on to the bubble bottle. And then oh, I want you to put the bubble blower back in the bottle. And then you move the bottle over to the table and say, oh, I want you to dip the blower into the bottle. And I want you to blow. Oh, you, it's not working. OK, I'll blow. So that what you are doing is then moving it back to the table by getting them to have cooperated with a sequence of instructions. OK, and then three more, three more bubbles and then and if you feel that the child is then able to go back to work, you're going to insert then more work. If you don't, if you feel that you want to create more momentum, then you add another desired activity or high preferred activity, such as three more bubbles, then Lego. And in this way, what you're doing is that you're creating the momentum back to the work. You've given them a movement break, you've followed the lead, you've done it in a calm and patient way, if they then re-engage with the work, you found an intervention method or a support that's effective in, in assisting this child, which includes following their lead, giving them a break, naming what they're doing, using instructions in a behavioral momentum way, and building it up to coming back to the table. For children who, if they're at the table, impulsively grab items, the block design cubes or some other materials that are part of the assessment at a time when they shouldn't be using it. This is where we do need to be more thoughtful about the way we physically set up the table. So for example, despite what it says in the standardized instructions, putting items slightly out of reach, using our arms as a shield, or placing our hands over items nice and calmly and gently, no difficulty, no need to give negative instructions like don't touch them. Or put them back, but just simply taking the items and bringing them back under our control. With block design, even this can be done where we bring the blocks back and we keep our model out of reach, though in view, and we hand them one brick at a time. And as we're getting or regaining cooperation, that we can see that they're attempting to make that into the same pattern that's in the blocks that we have or on the, the book that we have then you hand them the next brick. We then provide praise for every action they do that is moving closer towards what we're asking them to do. And we check that they've understood what they're meant to be doing. If this doesn't work, then we adapt our system to be much more play-based again for a little while. And we either at the end of that play are going to re-attempt the task, or we're going to acknowledge that this task isn't going to work right here, right now, and end it. The reason that we will turn it into play before ending it is that we are finishing this task on a positive note, not on the idea that their behavior is what ended it, that we've done it with fun so that they're more likely to want to re-engage with us at another time when we bring them out. The assumption to make is that it is, in fact, a losing of attention because their attention has exhausted them or they've lost motivation. Either way, rather than interpreting this as simply disruption or lack of compliance, to see it as a difficulty a child has in just maintaining or sustaining their concentration on the task, um, or they've lost motivation because they've become tired. So that what we're going to do is maintain the positivity in the task and either have a break, have a fun activity, 
or recognize that we've come to the end of our session earlier than we had hoped, but we're going to finish on a positive note. And at this point, it might even do one more fun activity so that the child will want to come back on another occasion or suggest that the parent goes for a walk or that we do some physical activity and then come back to it. But by making the ending positive, it makes it more likely that the child will want to re-engage when we do decide either after a break, physical activity, or in the next session, that we're going to do more work. When children do not appear to be listening or understanding the instructions, or they appear to have drifted off with their attention, so don't be appearing to attend to what you're saying. This is another moment to relax and wait. Repeat the instructions initially. If you still see there is difficulty, now is a time to repeat the instructions with reduced language. Sometimes the issue can be the not understanding what you mean and rather adding more language on with further explanation. We actually task analyze it and reduce our instructions. This is illustrated really well with the child that with doing some tasks like that involve processing speed and timing when you say, now do this as quickly as you can and tell me when you're finished, it is way too much language for them to hold on to. And they lose it. They forget that this is the purpose of the task, that it's being timed. However, if you say, now I want you to mark these off and do them quick, quick, quick. Now they've understood that this is something that is a race. It's a game. And even though I haven't said to do it as quickly as you can and do it until I say stop, we've used language that works for this child to get the intent of the activity. I might use physical cues and structures and gestures to emphasize this. In other words, unlike what's written in the standardized instructions, understanding that we're dealing with children that have limited attention, difficulties processing language, and poor working memory, so holding on to long instructions is really difficult. And make decisions in your mind whether this is a comprehension difficulty or a difficulty with attention or a motivation or a social difficulty. And what we mean by a social difficulty is I don't do tasks to please adults. I do tasks I enjoy or I don't do them at all. It's not a compliance issue. It's not a comprehension issue and it's not an attention issue. It's I'm autistic. And I do things on my own agenda. And if I don't find this intrinsically enjoyable, I don't do it as a way of just pleasing you as the adult. Or it's a motivational difficulty as in, I struggle to maintain my attention and sustain my concentration for tasks that aren't in naturally or intrinsically motivating to me. Or I wasn't really attending to what you were saying. And the problem is I just need this instruction again or broken down in a way because now I am listening to you. One of the difficulties we can have as adults is that we're giving instructions without actually having checked that the child is truly attending to what we're saying. So calling someone's name, assuring that they're actually attending before we give the information can be important. And then the other times are, yes, a child is attending, they're attempting to follow, but they simply don't comprehend the words. And the problem is they're not getting the instructions through words alone. So with matrix reasoning, it might be that you actually show the child how to do it. With the processing speed, like coding, it may be we actually need to model it, even do hand over hand until they've got momentum. Does this impact upon scoring? Absolutely. Does this mean you may knock off those items that you've shown them? Absolutely. What you're now attempting to find out through some exploration is what could be explaining why they're not engaging and what makes it more likely they will engage. This is qualitative information we're looking for. For some children who are not listening, we might need more gestures or something more clear. Now, like listening ears as we place up our fingers to our ears. Now, listening ears good listening years. In other words, and we're talking about children who are three, four, five, or six. 
and understanding that the ways that teachers would work with children, the way that ABA therapists would work with children or home tutors, or the way that people work in preschools are just as applicable to standardized testing clinic sessions as they are to where they work in those locations. How we interpret it, how we integrate that into our report, what this means for our scores is the secondary question we ask after the session is completed. And we've sat down with it all and looked at what it means. What we want now is to find out if we can get engagement and does that make a difference to the scores that we would have. On occasion, some children are going to become fascinated by the bag or the suitcase that has all the testing materials in it. And they're going to simply get out of the chair and walk around to where it is or going to lean over the table. And you can say, sit in your chair, hands on table. An alternative, or a one to do if that hasn't been effective and they seem still, seem still to be quite captured by this, the, the testing items, is to go with their intention. Oh, the bag, yeah, it's got all, of, all the fun toys or all the materials. Oh yeah, I've got lots of things in the bag. You want to see inside it and you open it up. Look, we've got lots of things we can play with. You may even go to the next step of placing some on the table, keeping them in your control. In other words, placing them inside but out of reach or using your hand as a shield, holding it with one hand but using your other hand as a shield. But going with their interest. You may even then say, do you want to have a look? Understanding that what we're attempting to do is encourage engagement through interest rather than simply compliance or external motivation. What we're attempting to do is to draw a child's interest into it so that they're naturally wanting to engage in these tasks. Then we can go through this behavioral momentum idea of, okay, let's close the box. You put them in, that's great. Then we'll put that here and we're gonna play with that next. Um, okay, let's put them back in the, in the bag. That's it, that's great work. Now, We'll look at those when we finish these ones. In other words, see it as part of the fun of being with a child rather than this is an interruption or a disruption to the testing. It is only when we understand, it is only when we think of the testing as only getting the scores do we see any of this as a problem. If what we see is that we're spending time with a child in a session, which is going to be fun, and that everything that we do is going to give us an understanding and appreciation of who this child is, their strengths and the weaknesses. We don't have to worry on this stuff. For some children, we may need some even more creative ideas because even the more standard ways, ways of working within the clinic at a table isn't going to be sufficient to get them to complete the items. For children with lots of difficulties with attention and impulsivity and high levels of activity that we may think of as in ADAD or ADHD, we might have a very physical setup in the room that involves lots of movement. For example, putting the visual schedule up on the wall where they have to get up each time we finish a task, grab the item from somewhere else and bring it back to the table. This brings in movement breaks with a task, with a message they need to do. We might even do a movement-based assessment where we're doing it around the room where each visual, each part of the visual schedule, each card is actually a big one where they jump or run to that location and then we move the table and we do it there or they bring it back to the table. In other words, we're, we're embedding within the process physical activity that gives them a break and allows them to use their energy can be extremely effective for some children for maintaining over 30 minutes or 40 minutes their, their, their persistence with doing the work. And certainly something that I've done in the past and found works extremely well is that a child works well in their preschool, particularly a special preschool for children with autism. I'll do it there. If a child demonstrates good engagement because they've learned it, they've had weeks or months of practice of coming in, sitting at a table, doing the work, they have a work system there, they have a therapist or an assistant, then go there and do it. 
one of the concerns, but what about the noise? What about, what we need to remember is this child is working there. They're sustaining their attention. So if they're doing it there, the fact that there may be other children around isn't any bigger problem. The fact they come individually into the clinic room, but won't sit at the table or remain there. So sometimes we need to be a little bit more open in our thinking and understanding the purpose of our task. We sometimes have created a rigid system that standardized means it has to be in a quiet room. No, it doesn't have to be in a quiet room. It's only if noise is a distractor or other children are a distractor does it matter. For many of these children who've struggled to come into a strange room to do it with a stranger, they're quite comfortable in persisting with their work in the preschool, even if there's lots of noise with kids vocalizing and people talking. But if that is a difficulty, then one way to construct it is that you deliberately set up a routine where that child will stay in the classroom whilst the other children are going out. You set up their schedule to know that they're going to be doing the work and other children are going to go off. They're going off to cooking or they're going outside. Of course, you're not going to choose outside if this is an activity the child really wants to do, so they just feel like they're missing out. But there are ways that it can be done that the child just sees this as what they're doing. And then you do the assessment at their table as if it's part of their morning work, as if it's part of their morning schedule, and you remove those distractors. And another even more creative idea, which I've done on occasions and again has proven to be extremely effective, is that when the issue is not even the structure, it's the fact that they're used to the class teacher or the preschool leader or the assistant, and they're not used to me, and they're not adjusting to the fact that I'm now doing this, and I don't have three or six sessions to build up that momentum, which is what I might do on other occasions. I'll actually coach the teacher or the assistant to administer some parts of it, particularly those that don't require considerable subtlety or precision, such as the block design. And that might be to either one, gain momentum. In other words, I get them to start some of the tasks and then we buddy. In other words, I sit next to them, next to the teacher doing it. They start with it. I then do one, then the teacher does one. And then in the next task, we move on to them doing one, me doing two. And then the teacher can then fade out and I continue it on. These are ideas that practically are effective. And most of these ideas have simply come about by collaboratively talking with people and saying, what do you think will work? Or what ideas do you think will make a difference? Again, this is in the context that if we weren't to do these ideas, there would be no standardized score at all because the child simply would not engage. The child hasn't, won't come into the clinic room. They won't cooperate with me. They won't engage with me because I am a stranger. Or even going into the classroom, the disruption caused by suddenly a new adult doing it so distresses the child that anything that is gained by doing it in the location is lost by the novelty of the new person. There are other ideas that we could explore, but I think this gives a good flavor of the creativity that can be there when you understand that the purpose of the assessment is to gain as much information as possible. In a later section, we'll talk about how you might interpret and put this into your report.